good evening, all. Happy New Year. As we rejoin our Bentley story following the three leaders' final victory in 1927, we're now going to talk about the car's successor, the four-in-one half-liter, and its iconic but arguably overrated submodel, the blower. Ooh, kicking it off with controversy. Acknowledging that the current competition model with the three-liter Supersports, or I believe it was Green Tag cars, were getting a bit long in the tooth and were unlikely to be able to take much in the way of further upgrades, W.O. turned instead to their larger touring car, the six and one half liter, as a base for a new competitive model. While this would also eventually give rise to the Speed 6, that's more a subject for another video, and before that car came along, the four and one half liter was developed by keeping the same robust chassis architecture that had served well up to that point in both cars, and installing a chopped down straight four version of the six and one half liters straight six that displaced 4.4 liters. However, as perhaps is indicated by everything I've been saying so far, 4.4 uh, liters doesn't roll off the tongue quite as nicely as 4.5 or 4.5, four so the numbers were fudged a bit to make things easier on the marketing department. Actually, at the, that point, the marketing department probably just consisted of, like, one underpaid temp, or they wouldn't have even been paid, probably, at that point. They were paid, in, I don't know, lead for their roofs or something, and the marketing department was actually the racing department, so be that as it may. The first pre-production prototype for this new potential model, dubbed Old Mother Gun, did indeed make its debut at the 1927-24 hour race, breaking the lap record on its second lap out, as well as on several subsequent laps, and putting a lap on the entire non-Bentley field by lap 12, which was actually one lap ahead of the team's expectations. Talk about being confident in your new design. While the Maison Blanche crash unfortunately stymied any attempts at a runaway podium sweep for the new car and the Bentley team, the new engine's performance was deemed more than acceptable to power a new car to replace the superannuated 3-liter and continue the crew mark's strength at the French Endurance... I can't really call it a classic when we're talking about edition number four at this point, but... Um, French Endurance Kerfuffle, or... Fake! Production on the new 4.5-liter commenced for 1928, utilizing an improvement of the tie-reinforced steel lattice chassis that had proved necessary in supporting the heavy cast-iron block engines that provided all of Bentley's motive power at the time. The engine sported twin carburetors from SU, which actually was a stalwart of fuel delivery for British motoring well into the 1970s, a single overhead camshaft with four valves per cylinder, and the engine was good for 110 horsepower in road-going trim, or about 130 in racing models. This was mated to an in-house built, fully unsynchronized, four-speed manual transmission, which definitely didn't help everyday drivability. As Bentley, similar to most luxury manufacturers of the day, sold their cars as a chassis sans bodywork, uh, performance figures for those given power outputs would vary rather widely, depending on if you went for an essentially monoposto single-seater like Mother Gun, or if your tastes skewed more towards uh, Buckingham Palace with wheels attached. Chassis weight was reportedly 1,625 kilos, or 3,583 pounds, so no matter where your bodywork desires lie, you aren't exactly getting a featherweight. Suspension was, as usual, double wishbones and push rods, except for the fact that it very much wasn't, because Gordon Murray didn't show up with them in a time machine like he was asked to, and instead they resorted to using the semi-elliptical leaf springs that were available at the time. Enormous 17-inch or 43-centimeter diameter drum brakes provided stopping power to all four wheels, with the drums featuring exterior fins to help improve cooling. The racing pretensions of the car were evident elsewhere as well, with all of the fluid filler caps for oil, fuel, cooling, I think at that point they were still just using water, uh, designed for quick access and lever actuation, and uh, also featuring in the transmission a direct final drive ratio. 1928 happily saw a resurgence of interest in the Le Mans race after a somewhat diminished 1927 field, and a three-entry Bentley team, all four and one half liter cars with a fourth brought along for spares, faced much stiffer competition than in the prior year, finding themselves down on power against some of the large-engined American and French entries. 
Indeed, in the end, the race did come out to a mano-a-mano -mano battle at the front between the Bentley of Wolf Barnato and Bernard Rubin against the Stutz Blackhawk of Robert Bloch and Edouard Brisson, Stutz being an American manufacturer, but the car being entered quite clearly by Frenchmen, with the Bentley plagued by water leaks due to a cracked chassis while the Stutz was losing gears throughout the back half of the race. Despite a last lap comeback attempt by the Stutes, the Bentley finished ahead by nearly a full circuit's length, with the distance, lap, and speed records broken yet again by Bentley automobiles. The lap record had been broken on the final lap of the race by the second best of the Bentleys, driven by Sir Henry Birkin and Jean Chassang, who finished fifth overall despite losing three hours trying to get their car back to the pits after a tire blew, subsequently wrapping around the axle, and then the wheel itself collapsed after Birkin tried to make it back on just the rim. Racing, as I've said before, was a little different in those days. The third Bentley entry of uh, Frank Clement and Dr. Dudley Benjafield failed to finish, also experiencing radiator issues brought on by a cracked chassis. The consensus at the Bentley team, then, was that while victory had been achieved, improvements were needed for next year, and the team split into two camps over what to do. W.O. was single-minded. Power comes from increased displacement, and any form of forced induction on his engines, which is to say supercharging as turbos had only just started to see contemporaneous applications on marine diesels, was, in his own words, to pervert its design and corrupt its performance. I think we can safely say he wasn't a fan then. Of course, this coming from the chap who's Initial reaction to the concept of a 24-hour-long motor race was that it tread the border of insanity, only to have his cars now victorious in three of these six occurrences of the race. So perhaps W.O. just needed to work on his neuroplasticity a bit. Anyway, he stuck to his guns and went off to make the Speed 6, which was a hotted-up version of their larger touring car mentioned earlier, while Sir Birkin took his own 4.5-liter and, with financial support from horse racing magnate Dorothy Paget, or Paget and engineering input from Clive Gallup, who helped develop the first Bentley engines, as well as from supercharger guru Amherst Villiers, they built this car, blower number one. Which is ironic, because actually there was a 3-liter Bentley that was supercharged as well, completely separate from the factory. Uh, but uh, that gets overlooked for some reason. Due to a lack of space within the engine bay, the Roots supercharger was mounted well out in front of the engine, which exacerbated the car's understeer rather significantly, but power increased to 242 horsepower, so as long as one didn't take corners too aggressively, the extra power on the straights should balance everything out. It debuted in 1929, uh, actually featuring two-seater bodywork made of fabric, of all things. But this caught fire, and they went back to aluminum panels after that, which we see in this photo. Probably sensible in the long run. Now normally, this would have represented a rather complete divergence with the supercharged cars modified after the fact, and therefore ineligible to compete at Le Mans due to insufficient production numbers, but back in 1926, W.O. had found himself out of cash. One of his drivers, the aforementioned Barnato, had lots of money, as he was heir to a South African diamond fortune, as one does, and he became majority shareholder and chairman of the company after investing a couple hundred thousand pounds. This gave him, well, rather a lot of say over the company's direction, and while W.O. stood staunchly against supercharging his engines, probably saying something like, so you'll almost certainly manage one lap of wherever we're going, and then it'll explode. Barnato's compunctions were not quite as strong, and he was won over by Birkin, and he unilaterally decreed that the 4.5 liter would be supercharged. However, W.O., as chief engineer and designer, refused to rework the engine and chassis to accommodate such a perversion, and this forced the supercharger to go right out front, as it had on the Birkin prototype. Some rework did end up becoming necessary with modifications to the cooling and lubrication systems, as well as the pistons and crankshaft on the inside of the engine, but that supercharger still had to sleep on the porch. 55 total cars were built with superchargers from the factory, out of 720 total 4 one half liter cars produced, at an almost 40% price premium over the naturally aspirated cars, 
But despite Birkin's and, to a lesser extent, Barnato's confidence that the additional power would improve the 4.5 liters competition prospects to no end, it was not to be. In 1929, the blower had not yet hit the production numbers needed to be able to contest the Le Mans race that year, so the entries were instead three regular 4.5 liter cars, as well as one new Speed 6 which would go on to win, with the other 4.5 liter cars coming 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. 1930 saw Birkin finally able to bring his blower to La Sarthe, indeed fielding two as a semi-private entry, alongside a trio of factory Speed 6s. Despite a small 19-car field, it was a field of quality, with entries from Stutz, Talbot, and debut entries from Mercedes-Benz with the supercharged SSK and Alfa Romeo with the supercharged 6C, both of them private entries but running factory personnel and uh, with not insignificant backdoor factory support. The Birkin-driven blower was indeed the only car that could even hope to keep up with the enormous 7.1-liter engine of the Mercedes, uh, but he had consistent issues with his tires going off to seek new climbs at the high speeds that they were achieving, at nearly 200 kilometers an hour down the Mulsanne, or 124 miles an hour, uh, back in the days when the Mulsanne straight didn't have chicanes. And as the race wore on, both of the blowers blew their engines, retiring at hours 20 and 21, although, in fairness, the Mercedes had dropped out in the 10th hour with electrical issues, so kind of a moot point except they weren't going to win. The Speed 6s then continued the Bentley tradition of reliability that had not carried over to the blowers, and finished first and second overall, making it three straight wins for Barnato, who promptly decided to retire on a high note, and four straight for Bentley. The uh, third Speed 6 entered, retired two hours into the race due to an accident. It was also Bentley's last race at Lasarth for many a decade, as the Great Depression set in and funding dried up. Indeed, Bentley itself would be sold uh, the subsequent year to Rolls-Royce, while the blowers soldiered on as privateer cars for a few years. But, indeed, W.O. seems to have been correct in his assessment this time that the supercharger had, while making it immensely powerful for brief periods, had taken away all of its reliability. Its best results came in the form of a second-place finish at the 1930 French Grand Prix, two and a half minutes behind the winning Bugatti, and in setting track speed records at Brooklands in 1931-1932, which stood only until 1934. So, not exactly standout. They did, nevertheless, enter the public zeitgeist through a combination of the audacity of the design, their rarity, and the blower's subsequent appearance in pop culture, primarily through Ian Fleming's James Bond novels, such that they command many millions of pounds on the unusual and rare occasions when they come up for sale. Standard 4 and one half liter cars, while not nearly as valuable, still command a rather commendable price, depending on their provenance and condition. That brings us to the end of another video, and for this week's call to action not featuring the three sacred words of YouTube, Like, comment, subscribe. Try and stick to those uh, New Year's resolutions for those of you that have made them, and for those of you who didn't, well, uh, fair play to you, or if you're looking for a suggestion, maybe do some Duolingo or take a hike or something, I don't know. Uh, incidentally, the Duolingo Diamond League is more competitive this week than I've seen it in a very long time, and I'm on a 1,600-plus day streak, which probably bespeaks how much of a weirdo I am. So clearly some of you are keeping up with those resolutions so far. Anyway, uh, be that as it may, thank you for your time this evening, or whenever and wherever you are watching, and I wish you all a good night and a good tomorrow.